In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Beloved in the Lord, in a moment of silence, let us thank God for the gift of life, for the gift of Jesus to us, and for the gift of his word. Let us ask him to send the Holy Spirit upon us to take control of this Bible study. Invite the Holy Spirit into your heart. Open your heart to him and to the word of God you'll be hearing. Tell him to come and enlighten you. Father in heaven, we thank you for this garden of your people. We thank you for the gift of your word, the gift of Jesus, the word of life the gift of one another, and the gift of technology. As we gather for this Bible study, we do not gather by our own power, but by the power of your Spirit. May he open our minds and our hearts to receive your word. Father, let this Bible story be about your glory, about our conversion and sanctification, about our transformation, and about spiritual fruitfulness in your kingdom. We make a prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst men. And blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and day of our death. Amen. Angels and saints of God, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I welcome you to this Bible study from wherever you're viewing it. For the sake of those who are just joining us, we are discussing worship in general and the Holy Mass in particular. So far, our discussion has taken us to the church building itself where the Holy Mass takes place. The church building has two parts. The larger part, which you call the nave, is where the congregation sits. And the smaller part is called the sanctuary. It is from there that the priest celebrates Mass. Currently, we are focusing on the sanctuary that is, the powerful symbols we find in the sanctuary. These include the altar, the ambo, the presider's chair, and the baptismal font. But also, around the sanctuary, we find two very powerful things, the tabernacle, and the crucifix or the cross as the case may be. The vital questions we are going to ask ourselves today will include what does each of these things we find in the sanctuary communicate to us? And how should we relate with these powerful symbols 
we find around the sanctuary. The point is that they are symbols, and but symbols communicate realities beyond them. So how can we use these symbols as means to reach the reality or realities behind them? Last week, we looked at the tabernacle. Today, we shall be looking at the altar, meaning that I will leave the discussion on the presider's chair and the baptismal font till next week. And subsequently, we shall look at the baptismal font and the crucifix, which, as I told you before, are two things we need to pay attention to. That is the crucifix and the baptismal font. I believe that if we are able to grasp what these two things stand for, take them to heart and implement them, the impact on us as individual Christians and on the church as a whole will be massive. I'm talking about the crucifix and the baptismal font. So these are going to be two discussions on their own. And I would appeal to everybody not to miss those two discussions. Before we delve into today's topic, let us quickly have a recap of our discussion last week. Last week, we said the following, that the tabernacle is the place we reserve the blessed sacrament in the church. The tabernacle reminds us that the Eucharist in it is Christ. It reminds us of Christ's presence among us. The presence of Jesus in the tabernacle should increase our reverence when we enter a church. Then we talked about genuflecting to Christ in the blessed sacrament in the tabernacle when we enter the church. This should not be a mechanical or empty exercise, but a gesture of reverence and prayer whereby we use our body to communicate something profound to Jesus, such as one or all of the following four things, three of which are attributed to Father Mike Smith. The first of the four things is, that is when I genuflect, I'm saying, Jesus, I believe in your real presence in the Holy Eucharist as you taught us. Two, it is a posture of humility and adoration. And we are saying to Jesus when we genuflect that Jesus, you are Lord. I am only a man. I adore you as my Lord and King. Three, we are saying to Jesus, I am loyal and I commit myself wholeheartedly to your service and to your mission. Wherever you may need me, send me. Use me, Lord, wherever you may need me. Lastly, we are saying to Jesus, Lord, I love you with all my heart and I wish to love you forever. Nevertheless, though we mentioned four things, we could actually say more depending on what we sincerely feel for Jesus in our hearts. For instance, if I've made a specific commitment to Jesus, when I enter the church and then reflect towards the blessed sacrament, it can be a time for me to adore him and renew that commitment. For instance, I say, Jesus, the commitment I made to you, I mentioned it, I am renewing it. I will keep it by your grace. Finally, we reminded ourselves as usual that mass or worship is first and foremost about God and his enjoyment, not ours. So we must always go to church 
to offer ourselves to the Father along with Jesus in the Holy Spirit in a way that is acceptable to him. Today, our discussion will shift to the altar. I thought we would be able to discuss the altar, the ambo, and the presider's chair, but I don't think that's going to be possible. So today we are going to focus on the altar. And the question we should be asking ourselves is, what is the altar? And what does it symbolize or communicate to us? What is the altar? What does it symbolize? What does it communicate to us? When we see the altar, what should come to mind? I want us to turn to the scripture at this point by inviting our reader to please read five passages for us from scripture. The first is Exodus 30 verses 1 and 2. The second is Exodus 20, verse 24. The third is Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. The fourth is Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And the last is Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. So we must follow the readings. Exodus 30, 1 to 2. You shall make an altar to burn incense upon. Of acacia wood you shall make it. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its breadth. It shall be square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. Exodus 20 24. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen, in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. I will come to you and bless you. Matthew 5, 23 to 24. So if you are offering a gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Revelation 6, 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness they have borne. Revelations 8, 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to mingle with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar before the throne. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, as we can see, all the readings from the Old Testament and the New Testament have something to tell us about the altar. God commanded Moses to make an altar. He commanded them to burn incense upon the altar. Jesus made reference to the altar. There is an altar in heaven. Not just an altar, an altar where incense is burnt in heaven. My point is that the use of altars for the true worship of God is scriptural. It is not something the church has manufactured. It is right there in the Bible. The altar we have in our church is a table-like structure upon which we celebrate the Eucharist. Following the liturgical reforms of Vatican II, 
A more appropriate arrangement of the sanctuary in a church should be as follows. On the sanctuary wall, we should have a centrally located life-size crucifix or cross. Under the cross, we should have the presider's chair on a slightly elevated platform that will enable the people to see him behind the altar even when he's seated. Then in front of the presider's chair, we have a centrally located altar with some space in between. This space allows the presider to stand behind the altar and face the people while celebrating mass. And also it allows for free movement around the altar. For instance, when he wants to incense the altar, he's able to move around the altar. Going down the memory lane, we can state that early altars were not placed against the wall. Sorry, I repeat. Going down the memory lane, we can state that early altars were not placed against the wall to enable the bishop or the priest face the people. But around the fifth century, the popular practice in our churches was to place the altar against the wall. This is what many people refer to as Vatican I. In this case, the priest celebrated mass facing the east, while the people faced the east with him. The sun rises in the east. Jesus is called the son of righteousness. The symbolism here is that facing the east where the sun rises is looking towards Jesus as the dawn. I repeat, the symbolism is that facing the east where the sun rises is looking towards Jesus as the dawn. Later, this practice was changed to what we have now. The priest stands behind the altar, which is not attached to the sanctuary wall, and faces the people while celebrating the Eucharist. Now, the good thing about the tabernacle being at the side of the sanctuary, rather than at the back of the altar, is that the connection between the altar of the cross, where Jesus offered his one single and efficacious sacrifice, and the altar in our own sanctuary, where the same sacrifice is being reenacted, becomes very, very clear. Jesus is seen hanging on the altar of the cross, where he celebrated his own mass. Below him, the priest who acts in his name, moves from under there to go to our own altar to reenact what he did on the cross. So here you can see the connection between that altar of the cross and our own altar around the sanctuary. But also the good thing about the altar being against the sanctuary wall with the tabernacle right in front of it is that both the priest and the people are facing Jesus during the celebration. So whether we are talking about what used to be, there is something good in it. Or we are talking about what is now, there's also something good in it. Some prefer what used to be, some prefer what is now. Traditionally, the altar is made of stone, which is the preferred material for it, even though wood can be used. But whether it is made of stone or wordy wood, not just any wood, or wordy wood, the altar is not a piece of stone or a piece of furniture. It is not just any stone or any furniture. Rather, it is a sacred object because it is consecrated or more correctly dedicated. That is to say, set apart for God through a solemn rite of dedication. 
And the altar we have in our churches, consecrated, uh, dedicated altars, all of them have relics of saints. To dedicate an altar, the bishop first sprinkles the altar with holy water, which reminds us of what? Baptism. And implies washing or cleansing. Then he prays over the altar and anoints it with the sacred oil of prison, which is the same oil they used to anoint toys during baptism and even used during the anointing of priests. After that, he incenses it. Then, with the sacred rite of dedication completed, there is a change in status. What was before the right of dedication is no longer what is now after the right of dedication. Just as you have in the case of baptism, confirmation, or even marriage. Before the right of marriage, you have two individuals who intend to get married to one another. But after the right is validly completed, what happens? You have a marriage couple. Before confirmation, you have an individual who wants to be confirmed. After the rites are performed, you have what? A confirmed Catholic. So after the whole rite of dedication, the altar is no longer ordinary stone or wood, as the case may be, as it was in the beginning. But now it is a sacred object for religious worship which is dedicated to the worship of God alone. When an altar is dedicated, you cannot use it for anything else. It must always be used for the worship of God and God alone. More importantly, following this transformation in status, the altar now represents Christ a living cornerstone, I repeat. After the dedication of the altar, it now represents Christ, a living cornerstone. Put differently, it becomes a permanent symbol of Christ and a visible sign of his presence. It becomes a permanent symbol of Christ and a visible sign of his presence. That is to say, when I look at it, I should see beyond the altar to see Christ who is symbolized by it. And then that should remind me that Christ is present among us. For that reason, we show reverence to the altar and cannot treat it as a piece of furniture or use it as a table where we can drop just anything. I know that sometimes you'll find some of us dropping A or B or C on the altar even things like our glasses, hymn books, commentaries, and so on. Of course, that is very, very wrong. In the real sense, only things that are absolutely necessary should be placed on the altar. And when we talk about things that are absolutely necessary for that mass, these include a crucifix, a corporal, that is the white cloth on which we place the chalice and the ciborium, the sacramentary, the microphone stand, if there is no simple microphone we can pin to the presider's chasuble. The two candles can also be placed on the altar, even though they can also be placed on two stands by the sides, the two sides of the altar. But what I'm saying here is that we do not just place anything on it. I can't remove my glasses and put it on top of the altar. I can't bring my hymn book and put it on top of the altar. That is not what the altar is supposed, the purpose is supposed to serve. Now, when we have such a profound understanding of the symbols we use in our church and in our liturgy, we come to see and appreciate the beauty of the Catholic liturgy and the beauty of a standard Catholic church building, that it is not just something that is empty, it is something that is there that has a lot to teach us. Everything simply speaks about Christ 
and draws our attention and our hearts to God. The tabernacle communicates the presence of Jesus and challenges us to pledge our lives, our commitment, and our service to him. The altar communicates the presence of Jesus Christ and the paintings and the statues take our minds back to God and heaven and continue to remind us that heaven is our true home and goal and we must live our lives here on earth with our eyes fixed on God and heaven. The question is, isn't, isn't that great? When what we, whatever we look at communicates Jesus to us, communicates God to us, and tries to point our hearts towards heaven. I believe that that is something great. Having said all that, I wish to state that the altar has a great significance in the church building. It has a great significance in the church building and the sanctuary. In fact, it is the most important symbol we have in the sanctuary and the church. It is the most central feature of the hierarchical center in every Catholic church. To reemphasize what I said before, the altar represents Christ, our living cornerstone, or the living cornerstone of our faith. Confer Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. Now, I know that many of you will be shocked to learn that the altar is the most central feature in the church or sanctuary. Without diminishing or removing anything from the great importance of the tabernacle, the altar is actually the focus of our liturgy, the focus of our celebration during Mass. At Mass, Jesus is not only the priest, and the sacrificial victim, but is also the altar of sacrifice. Hence, the altar is a powerful symbol of Christ himself and the most important symbol in the entire church. The altar is both a sacrificial altar and a table, I repeat, it is a sacrificial altar, and it is also a table, a table for communal meal. It is a sacrificial altar because it is on it that Christ's ultimate sacrifice on the cross is reenacted. And it is a table because the Eucharist is also a meal, that is, the Lord's Supper and we all are invited to it. In the real sense, this understanding of the altar as a table recalls the Last Supper of Jesus Christ with his disciples around a table in the upper room in Jerusalem. It also recalls the tables around which the early Christians celebrated the Eucharist long before churches were built. And finally, it reminds us that at Mass, we are also sharing in a meal. And I would like us to underline that, that at Mass, we are also sharing in a meal as a family, the family of Jesus Christ. To conclude this discussion, let us see the spiritual significance of the altar again. Here I shall focus on three things I mentioned earlier. One, it is a symbol of Christ and his presence. Two, the altar is a place of sacrifice. Three, the altar is a table. I'll repeat them again. The altar is a symbol of Christ and his presence. The altar is a place of sacrifice and the altar is also a table. Let us discuss them a little more. As I said, the altar is a symbol of Christ and his presence. This same altar represents Christ, who is the center of the church and our liturgy. 
as a baptized Catholic, I'm a part of the church, which has Christ as its cornerstone and as its center. Now, some questions arise from this, which I think each of us should respond to. Is Christ, who is symbolized by the church, I repeat, is Christ, who is symbolized by the altar, which is the center of the church, and who is also the center of the sanctuary, is this same Christ the center of my own life as a Catholic Christian? Is he the cornerstone, living cornerstone of my life in practice? Is my life rooted in him? If you read Colossians 2 verse 7, it says we should be rooted in Christ. Is my life rooted in Christ? Does Christ control my life? No matter where I stand on my journey towards Christ, can I at least say that wherever I may be, Christ is at the center of it. That is important. Also, my family is a part of this church that has Christ as a center. In fact, my family is a domestic church. Now, is Christ who is symbolized by the altar and who is the center of the church, also the center of my family, the center of my marriage, and the center of all the activities in my family. The same question applies to our societies and organizations in the church, and to our parishes, and even to the dioceses. Is Christ and his agenda or mission at the center of all that we do. Because the problem here is that sometimes we can lose focus of Christ and his agenda and his mission and begin to put other things at the center such that Christ himself becomes one of those other competing things or secondary things we do in our different organizations, parishes, or societies. So it is important to know that Christ, Christ's place in our lives, in our families, in our societies, in our parishes, is at the center. It should be the sun around which every other thing revolves. The altar is also a place of sacrifice. It represents Christ himself and is equally a symbol of the altar of the cross. So the altar I find in the church reminds me of the altar of the cross where Jesus sacrificed himself to the Father. On the altar of the cross, Jesus offered himself completely to the Father. That is, he sacrificed himself in an ultimate way. On the physical altar in the church, this single and efficacious sacrifice is reenacted in an unbloody way. In both cases, the language is always that of sacrifice or total self-offering. Now, at Mass, and right there on the altar, each of us should be offering him or herself up in sacrifice along with Jesus. Yes, you have the sacrifice, which is Jesus, but all of us should also be offering something ourselves along with Jesus and present ourselves along with the sacrifice of Jesus himself. At Mass, do I really see the altar as a place of sacrifice? When I go to church and I look at the altar, do I really look at it as a place of sacrifice where I am called to sacrifice myself along with Jesus? Do I come with the noble intention to offer myself up completely to God our Father? Each time I say to myself, I'm going to church, I'm going to Mass, do I come with that noble intention to really offer myself completely to the Father along with Jesus? 
And even I'm at mass, do I actually offer up anything to God at the altar? And does God feel the power of what I am offering? Can he feel the power of what I'm offering? Because that is important. Because when he feels the power of what I'm offering, he turns towards me. Finally, the altar is a table. It is not just any type of table, but a meal table. We go to church also to do what? To eat. We go to church to partake and share of the food and drink of Christ's body and blood. Now, let us ask ourselves some questions. Do we partake of this meal Jesus offers us regularly when we go to Mass? What about our spouse? What about your sons? What about your daughters? What about your helpers in the house who go to church with you? What about your friends or even fellow parishioners you meet in church? Are they also sharing in this meal? One thing I need to emphasize here is that it is not just an individual meal. It is a family meal. And when you're in a family, like your family at home, and you have a banquet, everybody is at table, some people are eating, and somebody is not eating, are you comfortable? Of course you're not. You want to find out why the person is not eating. You want everybody to partake of that meal because it is a sharing of your oneness. It is a sharing of love, the love you have for one another. So the point is when my spouse or friend or a particular parishioner is not sharing in the meal, am I really, really concerned? And if I'm concerned, do I step out to do something about it? My dear brothers and sisters, my prayer is that as we gaze upon the altar subsequently, we will be able to see Jesus Christ who is symbolized by it with our spiritual eyes and be able to feel his presence among us and in our lives. As we gaze upon the altar, may it always challenge us or inspire us to offer ourselves completely to God as Jesus himself did on the cross. As we gaze upon the altar, may it remind us of Christ's command to take and eat and to take and drink in his memory. In all, may this all-important symbol draw us closer to the reality itself. Jesus Christ himself who is the living cornerstone of our lives and lead us to make him the center of our lives, the center of our families, the center of our societies, and the center of our churches through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for listening. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And we shall continue next week with uh, the AMBO, and then the presider's chair. After the one of next week, we now focus on the crucifix and the baptismal font. The discussion on the crucifix and baptismal font, I would want everybody to follow those two discussions. If you're able to finish them in two sessions, I want everybody to follow them because we really need to understand what the church is about and then unlearn certain things and relearn certain things. If you want a church that will bounce back and be able to command the kind of respect they should command in society. So with this, I say thank you to all of you and I wish you a very successful week. So let us pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now, I want you to feel God's presence around you. He has promised that we are to or three gather in his name. He's right there in their midst. 
even though we are not all gathered in one place, but we are still gathered in his name. Time is no barrier to him. Space is no barrier to him. I want you to feel his presence around you. Feel his presence in your mind. Feel his presence in your heart. No matter what is going on in your life now, I want you to feel the Lord's presence in your life. Sometimes when things are not the way they should be, Satan tries to play a fast one on us to make sure that we do not feel God around us. He wants to make us feel his distance. But I'm telling you tonight that God is very near to you, that God is in your life, that God is in your situation. So I want you to feel his presence in your life. Today, a discussion centered on the altar, a symbol for Christ, the living cornerstone of our lives, the center of our lives. St. Paul says in Colossians 2 verse 7, be rooted in Christ. In verse 6, it says, live your lives in Christ. I want you to look into your daily life. You may be a sinner. Everybody is a sinner. You may be struggling. Know that others are struggling. No matter where your struggle has taken you, can you see Christ in that struggle? Can you see Christ at the center of your life? Do you see your life moving towards Christ as its goal? Christ, the altar, which symbolizes Christ, is the most important symbol in the church during Mass. How important is Christ to you? What do you need to do for Christ to take the center stage in your life? The altar is also a place of sacrifice. Only one thing takes place at the altar, sacrifice. There, Jesus offers himself to the Father in an unbloody way. And we are supposed to join him in offering ourselves up to the Father. Is there anything God is asking of you? 
Is there any burden he has placed on you? Oftentimes we pray, Father, give me this, Father, give me that. He loves us and would want to answer us. But life is not only about receiving from God. Life is also about offering ourselves to God. Jesus gave us that example. In everything, he sought to offer himself completely to the Father. What demand is God making of you? Is there an area of your life where he's calling you, saying to you, my son, my daughter, you have to offer yourself up more. You have to do more. Is there anything you may be holding back from him? When Jesus offered himself completely to the Father, did the Father respond? Did he not give him glory that is above the name that is above every other name? When I begin to offer myself more and more to God, I do not lose. When I give God glory, God glorifies me in return. The altar is also a place for meal. It is a place for family meal a place we celebrate one another, a place we show love. Do I promote this family spirit in the parish? Am I concerned about others? Even when I show concern about their receiving communion, am I also concerned about their temporal, tem temporal affairs? How can our parishes become a place of love? A place where we see ourselves as one irrespective of status, social status. Today, we have listened to the word of God. What is your response? Can you turn to God in your heart, tell him, your decision based on today's teaching or sharing. What is it calling you to do? And what is your response? I repeat, what is God calling you to do? Did anything strike you in the course of the discussion? If something struck you, that is God inviting you to reflect further. Now, what is your response? Yes, Lord, I will do it. I will obey you. Oh, Lord, I am not ready. If your answer is yes, Lord, pray that the Holy Spirit will empower you not to forget, but to go about doing that thing. Finally, when God gives his word to us, 
He does not want us to keep the word to ourselves alone. We are meant to share his word. Who are the two people God may be sending you to today? Who needs to hear what you heard today? Maybe your son or your daughter or your spouse or a friend or somebody in your village or somebody even abroad. God is sending you as his herald, as his messenger. Can you reach that person or those people in the next 24 hours? And can you continue reaching people every day to share the fruits of your encounter with the Lord? Let us now turn to ourselves during this period of the pandemic, many of us are experiencing fear and anxiety. And I want you to listen to what the Lord is saying. In Isaiah 41 verse 10, he says, Fear not, for I am with you. I repeat, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will give you strength. I will bring you help. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. God is not man who can lie. He is God. He is truth personified. Turn to him now in your heart, standing on his word that is spirit and life, and say to him, Lord, you have promised me your help. You're telling me not to be afraid. And now begin to let every fear in your life, fear of anything, let it begin to dissolve now in the name of Jesus Christ. Your life is not in any man's hand. Your life is not in any woman's hand. Your life is not even in the hand of the so-called powerful people. Your life is in God's hand. Tell him, Lord, my life is in your hand. I depend completely on you. My trust is in you. I place my trust in you. Your word says, be still and know that I am God. Lord, enter into my fear. Enter into every situation in my life. Whatever situation you have in your life, maybe fear of your finances, fear for your children, fear for anything at all. Bring God into it. Scripture says, cast your burdens upon him. Great things happen when God mixes with men. Your plans, oh, things are not working now. This pandemic is really hitting hard at me. The word of God tells us in Psalm 127 verse 1 and 2 that if God does not watch over the city, in vain will the watchmen watch over it. Call him, tell him, Lord, my provider, even in the midst of a pandemic, you will make a way for me. David himself said that much when he said that even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. In verse 5 of Psalm 23, it says, Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemies, and my cup overflows. Verse 6 says, Surely goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life. 
The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack. Commit everything into his hands now. Tell him, Father, my life is in your hand. My spouse's life is in your hand. The life of each of my children is in your hand. I have your way. My situation is in your hand. My health is in your hand. My everything is in your hand. Finally, I want you to forgive somebody. There may be people that have sinned against you, people that have done injustice to you, whether in your family, whether in your village, whether in your place of work, there may be somebody or some people. Can you offer something to God now? Tell him, Lord, as I close this Bible study, I offer you this forgiveness that I'm offering to this person. The person doesn't have to deserve it. Lord, for your sake, I'm releasing this person. I forgive. I forgive. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for every one of your children, everyone who has left everything to come. We thank you for those who wanted to be here with us but could not make it. We present them, their families, their work, their faith, their all, their problems, every challenge they are facing in their lives, we present to you. Your word says, be still and know that I am God. Father, may you manifest your power and your glory in their lives. We pray that you break every chain in the lives of your children. And as you set them free from these chains, we pray that your blessings and favors will be upon them through Christ our Lord. Amen. A lady help of Christians, pray for us. Angels and saints of God, pray for us. The Lord be with you. May the Almighty God bless you, protect you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bye for now and see you next week.